Well, we're currently studying a little book of the Bible um, written by a close follower of Jesus whose name is Peter. I remember when I first became a Christian and, and we first gathered with this little uh, church group in a home, and, and the first thing they said was turn to Peter. And I'm like, which one of them is Peter? And, and then I realized, though, they were talking about in the book here. And so if you're new here and you're not really familiar with the Bible at all, just welcome. And just please feel free to ask questions. And you can only start from where you're at. And so we're all in different places in this journey. But we're just here to, to really hear what God has revealed about himself here in this word, in these writings, which Jesus actually says are the very words of God. And so we're, we're here to really get to know Jesus more and more. And in so doing, we want to just to be able to grow in our love for him, to grow in our understanding of, of his will for us. And so if you don't own a Bible, it's also, we've got a few Bibles, I think, left here on the table. So feel free to take one of those Bibles off the table, use it for today. If you don't own one at all, then just take that Bible home with you. It's our gift to you. We'd love for you to, to have that. Now, when you're not from a, from a country, you can be one of a few things, um, one, you could be an immigrant. Uh, that's somebody who, who lives here, settles in. You start to take on all the, the, the values of the culture. And, and some professing Christians live this way. They, they take on the values of the culture. They, they just aim for comfort in the here and now. After all, you, it's YOLO. You only have one life to live. So, so they're worried maybe they're going to miss out. So they find themselves hoping that Jesus won't return until they at least experience being, being married and maybe having kids or at least maybe having, having their kids get married and have kids. Or, or whatever it is, but living for the here and now. And, and, and then secondly, you can come in and you can be like a tourist. And so a, a tourist, someone just passing through, they don't really get involved with people in a committed way. Uh, you just stay separate. You hang around with other tourists and you, you hit the high spots of any location. And so you're kind of like waiting to get raptured because you're just passing through. Or, or thirdly, you could live like an exile like a permanent alien, an ambassador. And this is the language that Peter is using for us who are Jesus followers. Because we're not immigrants, we are citizens of heaven. And, and we're not just tourists, but we're actually stationed here and, and we're, we're to get planted here. In fact, Jeremiah 29 gives us a glimpse into what God desires of his exiles. And this, this scene in Jeremiah is when Israel was exiled uh, to Babylon. And, and the Babylonians, they were seeking to assimilate the Israelites right into Babylon, so they just become one with them. But the prophets of Israel, but we learn from Jeremiah that actually they're false prophets, and they're not actually saying the things that God uh, called them to say, but they were declaring, no, stay outside of the city. Don't have anything to do with it. It's a wicked, idolatrous uh, place. God's going to destroy that wicked city, so just stay on the outskirts. In other words, just disdain the wicked city of Babylon. But Jeremiah, the true prophet of God, he actually says both those groups are wrong. In Jeremiah 29, 4, we read, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, live in them, plant gardens. He tells them to move in there, marry, uh, get settled in. You're going to be there permanently, he says. But verse 7, he says, but seek the welfare of the city. That word welfare is the word shalom. Seek the shalom, the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For its welfare, you will find your welfare. And so we're to love the city. We're to seek, we're to seek their best, because the city can be a place of exhaustion, and they need, they need to find rest for their souls. The city can be a place of great oppression. They need to have an advocate. And so typically, though, people just want to use the city. And this was me for many years. The city was a place to use, right? Just get what you need, get out. Get my degree, get out. Get my groceries or get what I need, and then get out. But God's call to the exiles is actually to move into the city, or really our our culture that we have, to love the city, not to assimilate and just, just become like those who don't know God, and, and not just keeping ourselves separate and just use the city, but rather seek its welfare, its, its shalom, its, its wholeness. So really, that's what Jesus did. Even as he came into the world uh, as an exile, he lived this distinct holy life, even as he came right into our midst. And so he so loved the world 
that he gave his life for the shalom of a broken and sinful and idolatrous and enemy people. So, so Peter uses this language of an exile or alien, an ambassador, to describe the Christian life. And an ambassador is someone who's actually sent into another country with a mission from another country. And so we are to be salt and light. We're to, we're to sink into the fabric of our culture. That's our mission. And Peter does tell us that as exiles, we should expect that there's going to be a hostile environment to really what uh, we're called to be. And so he writes to these believers to not lose their hope so that they can fulfill their calling as ambassadors, representing Jesus in a land that doesn't recognize his lordship for the most part. So we've reached then 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. So here's our scripture. It'll be on the screen. You can follow in your app or in your Bible as well. Reading from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So I'd just like to pray again before we start. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your grace. And I just ask for, for that grace now, even the Lord, just keep my voice, keep my mind at this point, just to be able to uh, serve, serve everyone here well. We want to look and see Peter's message, what it is he's saying to us, what it is you are saying to us through him. So Lord, would you just help me to do that well? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 13, he starts out, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Now, the Greek there is literally, gird up the loins of your mind for action. Now, most of you have never girded up your loins. So you're not sure maybe what this is saying. But you have to remember, back then they wore robes, and they would have been longer robes. And so to do battle, what they'd have to do is take up the bottom edges of the robes, tuck them into their belt, and kind of make these makeshift shorts. I know kind of like sumo wrestler shorts, but they were shorts nonetheless. And so why did they do this? Right? Because if you're going to go into battle... And you need to, you're going to have to uh, move. They would do this so then they could run, so they could move quickly. And so if you're going to do battle, you're going to have to exert your mind, is what Peter's saying. You're going to have to think. You're on a mission. And so what goes on between your ears is crucial. And so if your mind is sluggish, if it's robed, then you're not going to be ready for the action of the battle, the mission. And so he says... Prepare your minds for actions. Gird up the loins of your mind. And being sober-minded, he continues. In chapter 5, in fact, Peter's going to bring out the fact that we have an enemy, an adversary, Satan, who walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so we need a clear, alert mind at all times, he's, he's, he's telling us. Ever, ever been at a function uh, talking with a drunk? You, you, they don't tend to spoke, you don't tend to leave that conversation with a great deal of valued wisdom, right? That's not typically what you're going to get. You may get a shower of slobber a little bit as they talk too close, but that's what you think. So this call is to be sober-minded because it means the Christian's thinking is to be free from, from external outside influences. It's to be not under the influence of a foreign substance, such as false ideologies worldly thinking. It's to be totally in touch with reality. 
And so we want to be thinking clearly, first of all, Peter says, so that we can actually see our hope. In fact, this is the very first command in 1 Peter. We've gone through all these verses. There's, there's so much here to unpack. But this is the first time Peter actually gives them a command. And he says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So set your hope fully on this inheritance that he's been talking about that we have earlier in the chapter. So when the devil whispers, you don't measure up, you agree. But you set your hope fully on the grace of this gospel, on the merits of another. And that's good news. So in verse 14, when he says, as obedient children. So it's being a child of God, really, that's the motive for not being conformed to the self-centered desires of self-autonomy, self-rule. You've been born into the family, he said. And he's been saying this since verse 3, right? He's caused us to be born again as a new child in a new family with a new father that we love and we want to honor. And so this becomes our identity. We're identified as obedient children because it's in Christ's obedience in which he sees us. That's good news. Before, we didn't know the love and grace of Jesus. We didn't know the great inheritance that we we, we share with him and because of him. But now that we know, our passions have been opened up to just a whole new reality. In our former ignorance, the way he describes it, right? That's when we dabbled in and pursued sin, not realizing it was actually destroying us and destroying others. And so we didn't look at the glorious inheritance at the, that would be ours at the coming of the revelation of Jesus. We didn't look at life through the lens of eternity, but rather we just looked at the moment, right? We lusted for the temporary. And then comes the call. The proper response to our new status really as children. And he says this in verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. In all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay, that's a pretty big command there. So first, let's talk about what holiness is. We've already got kind of introduced to it in the video. And then we want to look at what our response should be. And then finally, how is it we can obey this command? So what holiness is? Well, the word holy, as we we saw in the video, comes from a word that means to be separated. It means to be set apart. It's to be unique, absolutely unique. See, Israel, they got in trouble when they started to think of God casually, like he was just a slightly higher version of them. But God is not that, right? He's not just a slightly bigger, slightly smarter version of us. He is totally unique. He is different. And you see this in Job, where where God basically, in talking to Job, says, when you create your own universe, let's have a conversation. Or Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God's saying, don't flatter yourself that you could just understand it all by me just explaining it to you or or telling you we're not peers. Or Paul says in Romans 9.20, he he, he asks the hardest apologetic question ever asked, right? If God knew that people were going to rebel against him, why did he make them in the first place? And Paul's answer, who are you? That darkens my door. Who are you to reply against God? That's his starting point. And so the point is not that there's not an answer, but the point is that there's a time when the mouth of the creature must stop and the knee should bow. And I'm not talking about checking your brain at the door and just believing things naively. I am saying that if this is God speaking, though, that we have to realize we're we're talking to the uncreated who is so far above you in every capacity. And so that has to be that the starting place. He is holy, holy, holy. In fact, in the absolute sense, only God is holy. And other things only become holy as a result of their connection to him, the Holy One. And you take even a shovel. Take a shovel that was just used for shoveling ashes in the temple. What did it become? It was called holy, this holy utensil, because it was set apart for God, for God's purposes alone. 
you couldn't take that shovel home with you, right? Do a little gardening or do anything like that. You could not do that because that object, that shovel was set apart and used for God's purposes, wholly devoted to God's purposes alone. So when many think of holiness, right, they think of something that's sterile, boring, but holiness, if you really think about it, is the perfection of everything that's good. And so we could think of it as wholeness, which is where we get the English word. And it's where you have holy, perfect goodness, perfect justice, perfect love. So holiness, if we really rightly understand it, should attract us. It should draw us. Think of a perfect justice, perfect beauty, perfect love. I mean, who wants a government that's partially corrupt or just a little unjust, right? And no girl wants to marry a guy that's unjust, lazy, self-centered, or dishonest. Well, who was it that said too late? <laughs> but, but God's holiness, that's what makes him God, right? He is love, a holy love. In other words, it's, it's above and beyond. It's, it's, it's transcendently unique. It's, it's completely whole and perfect. He has a power, a holy power, which means above and beyond. He has a holy wisdom. It means it's above and beyond. He's off the charts. And so God is a holy father. And that means he's not like your father. He is above any father you could ever possibly know. His love is pure, it is whole, it is perfect, it's complete. And that leads to another magnificent thing, the most magnificent thing I find about God's holiness, which was brought out in the video as well, which is when Jesus, God's holy son, came to earth, his holiness did not destroy us, but actually healed us. Jesus, who was holy, he touched unholy things, unclean things, and they were cleansed. Because normally, right, when clean things touch unclean things, the clean things become unclean, right? My wife has a cold. I'm lying in bed next to her, right, listening to her cough. There's no chance my wellness is going to make her better. But there's a real chance her sickness will make me sick right? <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. <laughs> but with Jesus, it worked in reverse. His holiness was not defiled by us. His holiness healed our unholiness. Isn't that something? The greatest display of God's holiness was not in his separating himself from us, but actually his entering into our sin, our corruption, and taking it upon himself and putting it away forever. And so, as obedient children, he says, be holy, for I am holy. And so the life we live should really be reflective of the, the God and Father you love. Actually, I guess it already is. It does. The life you live is reflective of the God you love or what or who you truly worship. That's sobering because that means our behavior actually reveals what we really believe. So, and putting God first is not simply having God at the top of our list of priorities. I mean, imagine, imagine if I said to my wife, you know, of all the girls I'm romantically involved with, you're my fave. You're number one on my list, right? No, she gets her own list, right? And she's not just number one. She's the only one on it. And, and God does not want to be number one on your list. God gets his own list. No one else in your life created the universe you live in and died for your sins. Jesus is not your co-pilot. He owns the plane. He's not your BFF. He is holy. He's holy. Our worship of God, it should be on a whole different plane, right? I sometimes get disturbed seeing how, how some people express their worship of God, especially when I see what the scripture says. Because I look here and I, I see all over, like, clap your hands, all you people. Not clap your hands, some of you. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. 
Or as the ESV says, shout to God with loud songs of joy. You know, this becomes that, that expression of things. Psalm 35 talks about those who delight in my righteousness, shout for joy. 1 Timothy 2, right, in the New Testament says, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands. Psalm 134, lift up your hands to the Holy One and bless the Lord. Praise His name. These are commands, right? I've read every command on worship, and none of them say, stand in a subdued manner with your coffee cup with a bored look on your face. I haven't found it. And some will say, well, that's not my personality. But I don't see anything in those verses about personality. Clap your hands, a few of you people don't see that. Or, but I don't, really don't feel like it. Oh, man, I got this head cold. Do you think I feel like being here? But I, I do, yeah. <laughs> You know, but I mean, part of me is thinking, oh, I'd rather have my head in a bed right now and a steamer going on there, yeah. But, but I don't feel like it. That could be true. But he's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. So you don't worship based on how you feel, but on what he's worthy of. And so let me give you a secret. Our hearts sometimes follow our posture. Now, we know that worship is not just a song, right? It's, it's, it's a life given to God. Romans 12, 1 talks about that. But in singing the gospel truths to one another, which is what it says we're, we're doing in the scripture, we're singing, uh, making melody in our hearts to the Lord, we're singing one to another, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to awaken one another's hearts, awaken our own hearts to the reality of Jesus and who we are in him. And I think this is part of uh, girding up the loins of our minds with this truth, right? This is sobering our minds to really do the battle of, to battle against the lies, the deceptions of the world, so that we can then run into obedience. That becomes the, the heart of that. Because our minds can get intoxicated with something else other than Jesus. Some of you are intoxicated with the desire for someone who's not your spouse. Some of you are intoxicated with the desire for a spouse so that you can be loved by someone. Some of you are intoxicated with the desire for people's approval. Some of you are intoxicated with the lust for money so you can get the comforts and all the toys you want. And, and you're in a far more dangerous spot than someone who gets behind the wheel drunk because this has eternal consequences, disastrous. And so Peter says, you need to sober up. And so you need to sing, you need to interact with the word preached with a desperation. It says we need to come with a desperation to, to God, right? And so that's what this raising your hands to God is just in desperation for the truth, Lord, just please, I need you. Awaken me to the reality of who you are, right? And then we get the reality that I have a spouse. His name is Jesus. And he's loved me with an everlasting love. And I've got the approval of the God of the universe as his obedient child because he sees me with the righteousness of his obedient son. And I've got an eternal inheritance that no one and nothing can take away. I have Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me as we saw in the very opening video, Galatians 2.20. So man, clap your hands and shout, sing desperate because so that we can leave here with sober minds and the loins of our minds girded with the hope and truth of who we are in Jesus. And then in repentance, we go, what was I thinking? as we're awakened to the reality and getting centered back in the truth of Jesus and who he is. And that becomes crucial. And so verse 17 then starts talking about fear, right? And what, 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 what should be there, right? And, and I fear being lured and, and being intoxicated with the world's lies, you know, away from the love of this Holy Father. And so the battle is real. As Sarah said, the, the battle's real, right? It's constant. And, and, and some of you are behind the wheels of your lives, and you're not sober. You're not in tune with reality. And you're driving. And so we should gather here a little desperate, 
are a lot desperate. We're totally dependent on him. So engage with the preaching, right? With this word, respond, right, to the truth. And what you're trying to do, you're trying to awaken, you're trying to sober your mind to the reality of who God really is and this salvation he's done for us is, is what Tim brought out. That we're flying. We're flying. So we're trying to awaken our own minds and waken up the minds of our brothers and sisters to the reality of Jesus and his gospel. And because we all come here a little drunk with robes down to our feet. So verse 17, he says, and if you call on him as father, Wow, what a privilege. Who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Because there's always the danger of falling into one ditch or the other. To licentiousness going off without any, any care about, about God and, and being separated and set apart for him. And the other side is falling off to just that religious legalistic duty mindset rather than Centering on life as an ambassador in an exile, set apart for God's uses and loving it. And so in this family where God is our father, we have God, the impartial judge, as our heavenly dad. And, and that means if he's the impartial judge, that means there's no favorites, right? I mean, uh, people will come and they, they'll want sometimes a pastor to pray for them, as if I've got some sort of special in. Well, I'm not the favorite son. I don't have a coat of many colors, right? Jesus is the favorite son, right? And he set aside his favorite position, and his coat was not just smeared with animal blood so it looked like he was dead. He really died, and he gave his life. That's his blood that was on his robes. He was killed. He truly yielded up his life, right? So his own blood was given in sacrifice so that I could have favor, as I'm connected to him. I could be viewed by God as his obedient child and have full favor. Verse 18, and here's why. Knowing that, here's why. Because knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times, listen for this, for the sake of you. Wow. Now, who or what's holy in these verses? I mean, who's the one without blemish and without spot? Jesus, right? And so when the Bible speaks of being ransomed, too, by the blood of Jesus, not just referring to the fluid that ran in his veins, but it's referring to his death, that violent, sacrificial death of crucifixion given for the sake of another, for the sake of you, he says. So his blood was spilled out to ransom us. If my unholiness looked upon God, I'd die. But Jesus took my unholiness upon himself. He looked into the face of God and died in my place. And then Jesus' holy righteousness given as a gift, given as a gift. And so now we stand as holy, obedient children, without blemish, without spot. Wow. All because our sins have been washed away in his precious blood. He calls it precious because that's what you say about something that cannot be replaced. There's no other way. Jesus was wholly devoted to us, and that's why we're called to be wholly devoted to him. And so these verses really give us the motive for our holiness. And whenever the word holy is used of created things, like we, we said, it refers to being separated unto God, to be, to be set apart, to be wholly devoted to him and his use. And so we're holy uh, to the degree that we're completely and totally devoted to him, which means there's no area in our life that, that uh, does not belong to him. And so we see, here's our motive. What motivates the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus that's ransomed us, that's what motivates us to holy living, to being wholly devoted to God because we're ransomed. Somebody paid a tremendous price to get us out of a predicament. And when I perceive the ocean of love that Jesus showed me at the cross where he shed his blood in a willing sacrifice in my place 
Because apart from that redeeming act, I'd perish in hell forever, and I deserve it. But Jesus wholly set himself apart for me, for my redemption. And that's my motivation for setting myself wholly apart for him, for his use. I belong to him. And you'll only be as holy as this is worth to you. So Jesus is committed to my holiness. He died so I'd be holy. He ripped himself apart so I'd be holy. So I can't fail to be holy. And there's a story in the life of David. And it's told to us in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 14 to 17. And in this scene, in this uh, portion here, you've got the Philistines who are Israel's enemies. And they, they've taken over Bethlehem. And they've got a bunch of soldiers are stationed there, and David's on the run. So David is in exile. And after a long day of traveling, kind of on the run, King David just said longingly, he says, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that's by the gate. And so these three mighty men who are so devoted to King David, when they overheard his desire, they, they risked their lives. They went through enemy lines and the well, which it says was right by the gate. So that means they would have had to fight their way in, fight their way out against the whole Philistine garrison. And they did this and they brought him water from Bethlehem. They would have carried it all the way across the desert, not drinking it to deliver it to their king. And this wasn't anything David commanded them to do. He didn't ask them to do this. It was simply just a wish, something he just, he sighed, just the longing of his heart. But, but being wholly devoted to someone means you want what actually delights them. You, your heart pursues what their heart pursues. And so this goes beyond just rules and commands. It's about love and devotion, and an orientation of the heart that just asks, how much can I do for this king? What are the desires of his heart? And so these men, they present then the water to David. And what's David do? Hopefully the scripture's on the screen for you. What's he do? He, yeah, he doesn't drink it. He pours it out on the ground, right? Which would have ticked me off a little. But... That's what he does. And he says, he says, far be it from me, Lord, that I should do this. Listen how he says it. Shall I drink the blood of these men who went at risk of their lives? And here we see what really being wholly devoted looks like. And this was just produced in these men just by his sigh. It wasn't a command. And they've greatly honored and shown their love and devotion to the king. And so we, we see that David, though, is saying something too. And he's saying, I don't have the right to that kind of devotion. It's to go to David's greater son. To him and to him alone, you give the water of your spontaneous love. Because David knew he didn't have the right to it. Now, some of you have your lives messed up because you're bringing the water of your devotion to a human being or something other than the one true, all-satisfying God. You're bringing it to someone who doesn't have the godliness to pour it on the ground and say, I don't have the right to it. The only one we should be wholly separated to is Jesus. And of course, Jesus is not just David in this story. He's also the mighty man who's so devoted to us. He is that warrior king, that mighty one. He hears our sighs. He goes up the hill, and he fights his way through the enemy lines to bring us the water of life. And if David thought the water from Bethlehem was so precious that he couldn't drink it because it came at the risk of his own man's lives, then how much more precious should the living water of eternal life be precious to you? Because it didn't just come at the risk of his life, but at the price of his life. Jesus fought through the enemy lines for us to bring us the cup of the new covenant through his blood, what he accomplished on the cross. And now this one who was born in Bethlehem holds out to us 
living water, the offer of eternal life. At one point, Jesus had said to the crowds, he used this language, I think it's in John, I can't remember if it's chapter 5 or 6, maybe it's neither, but he tells them, unless you drink my blood, strange words, isn't it? But look at the reference to the, what we saw in Samuel, unless you drink my blood. In other words, he said, I'm not going to benefit, I, I can't drink this water because I'm not going to benefit, take benefit from what they paid or the risk or the cost that they had. So when Jesus says, drink my blood, he says, unless you take and receive the benefit which Jesus achieved for you, you can have no salvation. And you're not worthy. But Jesus says, drink it. Don't pour it out on the ground, right? Jesus says, drink my blood. And now people get hung up because they get lost in the literal. But he's trying to get this metaphor picture. What he's saying, to drink his blood is to receive the benefit for which he didn't just risk his life, but for which he gave it. And Jesus says, take that for which I've paid the price and you have it freely, for which I was pierced through with many wounds because of my devotion to you. And so now he says, you be holy, devoted to me. Be holy, for I am holy. And so we see this great devotion. And David's men, right, they felt that way about him because they knew how he felt about them. He poured it out because he was not worthy of such devotion, but there is one who is. And Jesus didn't just honor us by pouring out a cup of water on the ground. He poured out his lifeblood on the ground for us. He was wholly devoted to us. And our hearts should just rise up and be wholly committed to him. If this is how wholly committed David's men were with him, then how much more should we be holy with Jesus? So when someone makes a statement like, you know, um, well, how much do I have to give? Well, I know they don't really get it yet. Because how much do I have to give is not the question that comes from love. It's how much do I get to give is the question of love. And we ought to hear the sigh of his heart. God, you, love for the, you have a love for the lost? Then, then let me go after them. Jesus, you love the church? Then let me serve her. Let me serve her. To be holy doesn't mean to be perfectly obedient. That's not going to happen until resurrection. But to be holy means to be completely submitted in the sense of saying, I take my hands off my life. I give you the rights to every part, every area of my life. I can't keep you out of anything because I belong to you. I am set apart for your use. So to be holy is to wholly belong to God, to be wholly devoted to him and his desires because he is wholly devoted to us. Do we have any questions? Praise God for that teaching video, which helped answer a lot of questions on holiness. Well, we're going to break bread together and call up Cam and, and where we really are remembering right? The great cost, the precious blood of Jesus that was spilt out for our ransom. And that's what moves us to holy living, being set apart for God's use, for his purposes, committed to his church, committed to his holy mission, to genuine love, which Peter goes to unfold as Brett will tell us about next week.